Welcome to the Health Enthusiasm Podcast, a panel discussion on behaviors, innovations, and trends in health and self-care. My name is Christophe Chaquet. I'm the author of the Health Enthusiasm books and a professional keynote speaker on health, business, and technology. Now, if you're new to the Health Enthusiasm Podcast, you might wonder what Health Enthusiasm is all about. Well, Health Enthusiasm is the aspiration that we all have to be healthy and happy. And as a result of this, Every company or organization is now more than ever focused on making their customers healthier and happier. And so every month, I discuss with a panel of experts the positive changes that are shaping our health and happiness. And for this discussion, we have three of your beloved experts in the panel. Calling in from Barcelona is our digital health connector, Aline Noiset. Hola. From Ghent, Belgium, but also calling in from Barcelona, human experience expert Mo Zouina. Hola. And last but not least, from Scotland, but living near Brighton, you've heard him before on episode 14 on voice tech and the vagus nerve, medical expert and digital innovation, Dr. Keith Grimes. Good morning, everyone. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Very good. Pretty good. Looking forward to it because we have a great show coming up, right? Exactly. Absolutely. It is a special episode because it will be released on the 14th of February. So we thought, why not make it a Valentine special? And so here we are. Today's topics are love, sex, and relationships. But first, some health enthusiasm, some positive changes that will impact our health and happiness. So tell me, Mo, what health enthusiasm did you witness in the past month? Well, I'm talking about a trend, a trend that is emerging right now. It exists for a while, but it's, it's really been present, present right now. It's called dopamine fasting. We've known intermittent, fa intermittent fasting. We've known metabolic flexibility. But today, dopamine fasting has become a popular practice. It's gaining traction and particularly among tech enthusiasts. And the Silicon Valley circles, they were very exposed to that. And the concept itself, it revolves around temporarily abstaining from activities that trigger the release of dopamine, the brain's feel-good neurotransmitter. And in this way, you try to reset the brain's reward system. You try to redefine what your baseline is. Now, the term dopamine fasting was coined by Dr. Cameron Seppa, a clinical psychologist, who introduced it and now has a book also, Dopamine Fast 2.0. And he suggests that dopamine fasting can help improve focus, reduce procrastination, and enhance creativity. Now, it's a bit nuanced. Some people think that our constant exposure to technology and the quick fix dopamine triggers from things like, we all know it, eh? social media, video games, but also processed foods can make us addicted, less focused, and unable to enjoy the simple things in life. And to combat this, they suggest taking a break from these activities. They say it can help us focus. It can help us less reliant on technology and experience true happiness. Now, it sounds like a new, a new cool trend, but experts have their doubts. They say it's too simple. And once again, Christoph and Aline and Keith, as you know, we love shortcuts. And that's the problem is that people also, as we discussed with the vagus nerve, people try to experiment with it, not really knowing the basics basics. And instead of a one size fits all, some experts suggest targeting specific behaviors or addiction. So it needs a little bit of precision. And they also emphasize moderation and finding a real good balance between enjoying things and being mindful because you can't stop a neurotransmitter in your brain from happening. That's, that's impossible. So it's important to approach it with caution and extreme re restriction, but it's also telling us that there's a new need to regulate that these dopamine triggers. So I think it's we're going in the right direction here. Yeah, indeed. And I, I do like this trend. I do agree that maybe it requires a little bit more context and detailed approach, but I like it because if you think about it, our social media is regulated, organized to hit, to make sure that you have these dopamine hits, right? The dopamine rushes, as they, as they sometimes call it. Actually, there's a company in Silicon Valley, which is called, I think it is Dopamine Machine, something like it, who is specialized in creating software and creating social media that actually make your dopamine rush and so that you are more addicted to the technology. So I think it's a really good counterbalance in what we've seen in today's world. I'll stay with the dopamine a little bit. I'll go to gaming, where, which also very often is created 
with a sense of how can we make sure that people continue gaming. So the dopamine rushes are very much present in gaming. But here I go to Spain, where gamers were asked to play a Fortnite game in an entirely new world or a new map, as they call it. And it was called Lost in the World. But the thing was that the game seemed to have some bugs. I mean, the character was moving super slow, so their own character. It also repeated sentences. Suddenly they were in other places without knowing how they got there. It was suddenly night, it was suddenly day. There was a lot of things that weren't working that well. Sometimes when, when they were passing a window or a mirror, they couldn't really see themselves all too well. And that led to some really frustrating reactions by those gamers. They were filmed by, they were obviously they're, they're streamers, so they, they, were, they were filming themselves while they were playing that game. And these frustrating reactions were, were very much amazing. But of course, the bugs we were, I just mentioned, they're actually not bugs because the, the game, in fact, was made that way. And it was made to replicate the reality of Alzheimer's patients. And so what they did was that with these authentic, frustrating reactions of the gamers, they created an awareness campaign. And they is the Spanish Association Against Alzheimer's and Other Dementias. And they use this to actually create some more awareness with youngsters to even involve them in the fight against Alzheimer's and dementia. But the game can also be used, of course, still to experience Alzheimer's. And it's not the first time that we see that gaming is used to build awareness campaigns. I, I once saw one from, um, from Sun and Sun a few while back, which was around eating better. Gamers don't always eat that well. And here, Sanofi created a game, or actually they, they created a campaign, which was called Ready Player Mom, which obviously refers to the ultra legendary book and movie Ready Player One. But what, what happened in the game was that the, the gamers were playing probably already for hours and suddenly in Minecraft, in Roblox or in Fortnite, suddenly they meet their moms. So their mom suddenly came into the game, like really like the, the figure as they know their mom as an avatar. And the mom started talking that like, you should be stopping, maybe not playing that much. Maybe you should eat better. Don't stay in your room to, <laughs> to eat. Maybe take care of your gut health. Obviously, Sanofi wanted to promote their pro probiotics in this way. But it was very nice that suddenly these, these gamers then looked into the screen and then, what, mom? And then they heard the voice of their mom talking, come on, guy, you need to eat better, etc. So uh, a lovely, a lovely, so two lovely examples, actually, about gaming and how we can create some awareness as that something diseases or certain health behaviors. I think we stay with gaming with you, Aline. Uh, what health system do you have for us? Exactly. So I've got one health system coming from Walt Disney and especially the orange divisions recently presented the holotype floor. So it's an omnidirectional treadmill ground made of small squares that can move around any person or objects. So the space can be quite small and users can actually walk unlimited distances in any directions in, in that small floor. And several people can even be on the same floor walking independently and without ever touching each other. So I thought it's actually thought initially for virtual and augmented reality experiences. It's also like the gaming that we, we mentioned just now, but the applications are varied. So it can include like theater, dance, shows, etc. So it's really reinventing things. And I thought it was, in, it was interesting to think about it from the healthcare perspective. Like you can think how you can do exercises at home, like making it more fun. Uh -huh. And also if we think about rehabilitation centers, and also n nursing homes, so to have the, the, the residents to, to keep them active, so like in a small space, several people on that small square. And also we can have them travel virtually through virtual reality, like it, with that technique. So I thought it was, a, it was very interesting and looking forward to seeing that in action. Yeah, lovely. And so what you said is that it can also be used to have maybe elderly walk more or do some exercises in nursing homes. Was that it? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, that's lovely. I think because my next health system comes close to moving and exercising, even in small spaces, actually. But at this time, it's not a nursing home. It's more in our own homes. Because, I mean, in, in my second book, which is coming out uh, pretty soon now, I talk about how homes are the biggest investment in our health, right? It's, it's the place where we spend most of our times anyway. And so we, more and more, we try to organize our homes and what we do in our homes 
in a specific way so, so that it can have a positive impact on our health. And so this is part of the health reason, right? We want to, we want to be healthier. We want to be happier. And in the place where we spend most time, we want to do something good for our health. And this is what we've, what we've been seeing definitely since COVID because we spent so much time at home and during COVID. And what you see is that a lot of real estate building companies, they say that more and more people want to add a gym into the house or even at work or whatsoever. Obviously nobody or not many people can, can afford having a proper gym in their homes. And so, because many people live in small apartments, right? But so there's the, obviously this one company that is specialized in providing all sorts of furniture for in our small spaces in our regular homes, and that is IKEA. And they are really focused on health and happiness and, and many of the things that they're doing. And so here they really launched a new product, product line actually, which is called Dailin, um, which means daily in the accent of Schmerland, of Schmerland, which is the birthplace of IKEA. What they did is they brought to market like 19 different versatile products that allows you to be working out at home every day. So it's really a whole line of products that allows you to work from home, which they didn't have at the moment. There, it's, it's very smart, apparently. It's adaptable. It's multifunctional. It also functions as a storage space. It's very beautiful and well-designed and, and, and so forth. So the idea behind it is that because we're so focused on our health, because we've spent so much time at home, we need to make sure that we can take care of our health and our happiness at home. And so that's why they created this Dylean um, product line. It's fun, it's easy, and it's a, a natural way to exercise, let's say, uh, every day. I liked that health enthusiasm very much personally. But up to you, kids. What do you have in store as a health enthusiasm for us? Well, I suppose you can't let any conversation about innovation go past without coming back to AI in some form. But I thought I'd maybe take a slightly different take on this because everyone's been very much enamored with what were called large language models. And then the idea that instead of just text, it would use images and sound with large multimodal models. But my health enthusiasm is large action models. This is generative AI that actually takes control of things for you. Now, before you get too scared of this, I'm going to come back and say that this was gently introduced and rather excitingly introduced to the world by a company called Rabbit during CES. And I saw this and it was a keynote presentation of a small orange device, about half the size of a phone. It has some really nice, comfortable interfaces, an analog interface and so on. And you essentially interact with it with a push to talk. You ask it to do things. Now, it connects to a large language model, so you can ask questions. In this case, perplexity, which is a provider. But the thing that is really interesting and I'm excited about is that it can also control other applications for you. And that's where large action model comes from. They built something called Rabbit OS, and that allows this model to learn how humans interact with applications and machines. And through doing so at scale, does it for you. So think of robotic process automation or RPA, but done automatically by an AI or a machine for you. Now, of course, it looked like a very cool toy and instantly all the geeks out there, including myself, pre-ordered such a device, which will be coming at the end of, end of March. But the interesting thing is like, why am I excited about this from a health point of view, a health and wellness point of view? And I don't know about you, but one of the, I suppose, good things about seeing tech increase is that people are getting more access to applications. But the downside is that we've got too many. My phone is absolutely chock-a-block with different apps that do small things that I have to move between. And the irony is that if you have health problems, the less healthy you are, the more apps you end up having, and it gets more and more complex. But on the clinician side, you have clinicians burning out in record numbers because of horrible user interfaces on EHRs. Imagine a large action model with a simple common interface in front of it that can do these things for you. And I think that is a real light at the end of a rather long tunnel and a sort of solution to some of the things that we're seeing as we get better at implementing this. Maybe there's a way that we can use a common interface, our voice, and the growing use of generative AI to start helping us interact more easily with technology. And then that allows us to continue to implement it. So I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, I, I can hear. And I, I've, I've written down some notes as well. I think I like the idea. There's a lot of potential and a lot of upside in that large action model system. And actually, 
We will go now to the unusual ones. The, I always try to, at the end of the health season, bring some unusual ones to, to you. And I have one here from Mo that is related to these large action models, I believe. Because also at uh, CES and, uh, this year, LG launched something, um, which they call, I mean, it's part of their bigger vision. It is an actual large action model. And it contributes to their very well, actually, to their ter- big picture vision that they have as a company, which is zero labor home. So that's the vision of L- LG. Um, and so my question is, what could they have done more? What could they have brought or presented at CES that also is actually a large action model that supports their zero labor home vision? What a challenge yeah. to try and find a hint of what that could be, the zero action model. So zero action would mean that you would just Zero think labor of, home it is. Zero, zero labor, zero, zero, zero labor home. Well, the laziness, the laziness you always talk about. It's the laziness. I think you just have to think about it and it happens. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's just it. There's no labor to do. You know, maybe it's a competitor for the Neuralink. Maybe it's something like that. But I think from the moment you think about it, it's done. Imagine what a mess that would be if an interface followed all our thoughts. Anyway, that's my hint. Yeah, it's actually. I gave you a lot of hints too, right? Yeah, so it's LG that they haven't given it a name yet, but it's an AI agent. It's a two-wheeled robot, but not bigger of a pint. It's like the size of your hand pretty much. And it just is a go-between, a bit like you were saying, Keith, between humans and their smart homes. And so it just roams around the house. It looks at everything, whether the windows is open, whether the humidity is good, whether the dog is doing well, uh, whether the indoor air quality is good. So it has a lot of sensors in it. And it can actually then automatically adapt or optimize the, the, the situation at your home. And you de- as you were saying, you don't need to actually verbalize it or ask it because the robot can actually also sense the emotion that a person is radiating it can even analyze the facial expressions or the tone of voice so that actually the, the, the way that the house is set up can actually be optimized automatically. Keith, that robot is going to be, is going to be knackered in the evening. It is. It's going to be zipping around. I'm just thinking, oh, my, my, my word. It's interesting, actually. I mean, Amazon tried something not similar to this, but a few years ago, they had a drone, didn't they? They had like a drone version of Alexa that would come around the house and act as a bridge too. I think it's interesting. I'm sort of thinking about this is that you could come home and you could diagnose the mood of the people in your family by whether the lights were on and what the temperature, if it was like icy cold in the hallway, you'd be like, oh dear, this is, I'm not coming back to a happy place. Yeah, interesting stuff. I was also thinking when, Mo, you were talking about a Neuralink, I suppose the next step beyond that is that it can predict what you want before you even think it. But then you're starting to get into black mirror territory, I think. Yeah. Well, we already, I mean, we already talked about these kind of things. I think it was Mitsubishi who launched a ventilation or a heating system that is also sensing the emotions in the room, etc. cetera. Um, but I think what is nice here is that if you think about elderly wanting to live longer at home, it is a more active way of, of helping them so that they don't need to think about everything anymore. So I think there's, there's definitely some upsides there. Let's go to Chicago with you, Aline, um, where we've seen the rise of three climate cafes in Chicago. What are climate cafes and what is their purpose, you think? Maybe I'm thinking coffees from different different places of the world, different tastes based on the climate there. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm not quite sure what coffee they serve, but I'm not, it, it's, it's not what I read about it anyway. Anybody else want to make a guess? I'll have a, I'll have a guess. I suspect that what it is, it's a cafe where they serve produce that you would be expected to get in a world where the climate has changed. So mm. it's looking forward. There's maybe global warming or climate change, and therefore we'd have certain foods available, not available, and only that is available on the menu. Yeah, it could be, but again, it's not what I've read about it. I mean, I'm not quite sure whether they serve it that way, but I, I suppose they don't. <laughs> Mo, you have a, a guess? Maybe it's a place where people talk about the climate with a cup of coffee or, exactly. you know, it's kind of a virtual meeting place for people who are concerned with the same thing. It's not a virtual, it's an actual place oh. where people meet. 
mainly because there's a lot of eco anxiety, as we call it, where a lot of people are very, they fear the future. They, they're a little bit sad because quite some nature has been lost or will be lost very soon. And so what we've seen is that almost half of the Americans between 16 and 25 are very worried or extremely worried about climate change. And even one third of the population is, is, is alarmed by it. So there's a lot of impact that it generates because it, it impacts our mental health. And so indeed, in those climate cafes, you can talk about the climate change, about your anxieties. And there are mental health professionals available. So it's actually a meeting place where you can talk about the anxiety that you have for climate change. But you can't take the car to, to go there. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, not the not the fossil fueled one. Actually, Christoph, the just yesterday I learned a phrase that it's attached to this. I didn't realize there was a word for it. It's called solastalgia. S O L A S T A L G I A, coined by Glenn Albrecht, an Australian philosopher, which is the sense of pain and distress caused by a a sense of the change in the climate. So okay. yeah, and that was a word that I just found out yesterday on social media when people were talking about some of the anxieties they saw seeing blossoms out of season. Okay. Is it is it any different from eco anxiety or I think it's the same, it's just a yeah. slightly sort of different term. Okay. Very good. Well I'll say with you, Keith. Um we'll stay in Scotland, if you will. So maybe you might know this. What are synthetic memories and what could they mean? for our health? <laughs> well, today is the day after Burns Night. And so a synthetic memory for most Scots today will be something you say to explain why you didn't get home on time last night. Synthetic memories, not sure. I suppose my first thought would be, this might be something that you use in a mental health or wellness setting, that you construct a memory that helps you displace a painful or upsetting memory from the past. So. Uh, it could be something along those lines. Yeah, it, it's, it is something along those lines. And I think more specifically, it's to help people again with dementia or Alzheimer's. So what you do is that you try to create a visual representation of what they can remember by prompting an AI image generator. And so you will bring images that should look familiar in some way to an Alzheimer or a dementia patient, which then gives them a very good feeling that it's an enjoyable acti activity for them. And it even brings them back in touch again with their own identity, because that is one of the major issues is that people don't, don't know really well how to feel or who they are. And so by, you know, creating these synthetic memories, you can create a positive experience and you can actually do something active with Alzheimer patients. So obviously, I mean, the, the current, the current models are still very biased. There's very American and English Western perspective. So I can imagine that in the South of America or even in the South of Europe, it might be difficult to have to create those, 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 those great images, but very promising in, in many ways and a nice application of AI generators. Thank you all for your health enthusiasms. And yep, it is a health enthusiasm world indeed. So many positive changes are making our world a little healthier and happier every day. If you want to know more about these Healthusiasm, go to healthusiasm.com and discover the other episodes or subscribe even to our newsletter. If you're interested, subscribe to Healthusiasm. Now it's time for something else. Now time for some love, sex and relationships. I actually wanted to include the song Let's Talk About Sex Baby by <laughs> Salt and Pepper, but I'm too afraid of copyright claims, so I won't be doing it. But anyways, in this segment, we will be talking about some of the most important things in our lives. The things in life that are so dear and near to us that they actually impact our health and well-being. I call these life aspirations, the universal human dreams and desires that impact our health and well-being. My new book, which will come out in April 2024, is centered around these life aspirations. I wrote about 24 different life aspirations, actually, in the book. But in this episode, we will talk about two specifically. One is loving, and the other one is relationships. Now, to give you a little bit of a, a definition, loving is about the emotional, physical, and psychological expressions and experiences that help us fulfill an intrinsic human desire for mutual caring, 
intimacy and deep connection. That is loving. And in relationships, on the other hand, is the quality or the state of having meaningful connections or social interactions with others. And so the link with loving and relationships is very big, with uh, very strong with health and well-being, because love has profound psychological and physiological benefits, of course. If you look at the research, you'll find that it can improve cardiovascular health, it could enhance immune function, mental well-being, uh, it could play a role in stress reduction, it could even positively influence pain management. Uh, and even if you feel loved and supported, you'll probably be more engaged in, in doing something healthy, let's say. And the same is true for relationships. I mean, if you have meaningful connections, it's not just about feeling good, but it actually contributes to your well-being, to your holistic well-being even. And by having these experiences with others, it has a positive effect on mental, emotional, and physical health. So by which, as a consequence, the people you choose to live with or do things with actually can have a, a really big impact on your well-being or your life and health choices in general. And so because of the importance of these life aspirations in our health and well-being, um, there's even an entire segment in the new book on sexual wellness and sexual well-being in itself. I call it the fifth pillar of our health. So sex to me is the fifth pillar of our health next to exercise, good nutrition, relaxation, and sleep. And it has been proven that this is the case. I mean, if you look at, there was a study done in France during 36 years between 1970 and 2006. And what we've seen is that the impact of sexual intercourse is very huge on how we feel about ourselves, on our own well-being. And actually, in the span of 36 years, it grew 25%. So 60% of women and 70% of men say that sexual intercourse is really very important to feel good about yourself. So a long intro to tell you that love, sex, and relationships, there's a lot to talk about. And... You know, what better day to talk about these than on Valentine's Day? But we'll do it a tiny bit different than normally. And instead of bringing an article or an ID, I asked each panelist to bring a statement about love, sex, and relationships. A statement that they would like the panel to think about, to reflect upon, to discuss. As you might know, as with the other episodes, we don't know what we will say. So this is unprepared in that regard. And it's even maybe a little bit more difficult this time because while otherwise we can read an article, here we only had a very cryptic statement. So I'm very curious where this discussion will go. And we will start with Mo. And I think you have a bit of a cryptic statement indeed, right? Yeah, thank you very much for that long introduction because there's nothing wrong with a little bit of foreplay, Christoph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's nothing wrong with that. So <laughs> my statement is, we are having less sex than ever, and that might solve our climate crisis, but maybe not the way we'd like it. So just bear with me because it's going to be a domino of statements and argumentations, but trust me, we'll get there. So let me start with an interesting fact. A recent study found that an astonishing 28% of you as men in their prime between 18 and 30 have not had sex in the last year. Let me say that again. Almost 30% of all US men between 18 and 30 in the prime of their life have not had sex in the last year. And that is disturbing for several reasons, but one most concerning is its potential impact on the future of our planet. One of the key reasons for this decline of sexual activity is the fact that fewer men are enrolling in higher education. Men have been graduating from high school at lower rates than women for several decades, and this trend is only getting worse. In fact, according to the National Center of Education Statistics, the gap between men and women in college or higher education enrollment is wider than it's ever been. And what is the consequence? It has a ripple effect on the dating market because women are still looking for signs that a man can provide. Or as Scott Galloway would say, a man needs to do three Ps, provide, protect, and procreate, right? Now, if you're 20 years old or 24 years old, what is the ultimate sign that you'll be able to provide? It's going to be a college degree or a higher education degree, right? So... In 37 countries and subgroups, women consistently value the financial capacity of a potential mate. 
and they do more than men do. For instance, U.S. financial stability and wealth were nearly 30% more important to women than they are to men. Now, if we know that men socioeconomically date on their level and lower, but women date on their level and higher, what is the result of fewer men in college? Well, fewer men that women are interested in. And we see that higher educated women have a very hard time finding an ideal man. And that's bad for everyone involved. It's bad for women who have fewer potential mates, but it's also bad for men. And let me talk about the role of technology there, right? That gradually increasing elite of men who have all the choice in the world, right, is becoming very, very scarce. And what is the upside for them? They have unlimited access to sexual partners, right? So that 10 to 15% of beautiful, wealthy men have access to 80% of the women. And what does that mean? They do not want to engage in a long-term relationship because there's so much choice, right? But under the surface of that iceberg of very successful and beautiful men, there are 80% of men who will be poorer, lonelier, and sexless. And what happens with a man who has no perspective of an intimate relationship? Well, that means that the cornerstone of our society's capital is going to decline. And that means that these men are also bad for political health too. What is the risk of lonely, poorly educated men in a society addicted to social media and trends and controversy and coreness and guns? Well, it means that frustrated men are increasing. They have less to live for and even less to lose. And these bored, lonely, poorly educated men is a bad force in any society. We see it eh, in the riots. We see it in, in war. We also see that role models are becoming toxic, masculine men. Putin is becoming a hero. Trump is becoming a hero. Elon Musk is becoming a hero, but not for fatherhood. He's had 11 children with three women, not living with any of them, right? So it's bad for masculinity and role models. Now, it's also bad for our economy because less partnering and propagation means fewer babies, right? Declining birth rates are toxic for economic health and they create a host of other social problems. At some point, the number of working age adults will not be enough to support the increasing number of elderly citizens. So that's my domino towards climate change is often cited as the biggest threat to our planet. However, climate change might become a non-issue in the face of decline. So if we have less sex, we will produce fewer gas, greenhouse gas emissions. That's the problem. But I'm sure that that was not the solution. We had a mind for that problem. So if you want to save humanity, have more sex. So this is quite a statement. I don't know if you were able to take that all in, ladies and gentlemen. Keith. Yeah, quite a statement. Yeah, no. A first reaction. It's interesting, actually. You, know, you covered a lot of different areas in there. And I think, you know, there's large parts of what you said that I immediately either recognize or, or agree with. I think the rise of the those that are finding it harder to find a partner with whom to be intimate and the particularly the incel movement, the involuntary celibate movement, which skews very heavily towards young men, disillusioned men who then cast around for role models and that can lead to much more uncomfortable norms being adopted is a, is a real worry. I, I absolutely agree with you there. It was interesting as I sort of looked in the, the depopulation issue, which is the natural consequence of this. And, and interestingly, you mentioned Elon Musk. And of course, Elon Musk is talking a great deal about the threats of this. And it said the, it's interesting that he has 11 children. When you look at some of the populist leaders, we have Donald Trump has well, more than one, I believe. And uh, Boris Johnson, who recently was in the UK, has, I think, an indeterminate amount <laughs> of children. He's not, he's, he's not really able to say how many it is. So there is something very interesting about that. And I tie it back to what you said at the start, is this sort of asymmetry then drives and concentrates more power, procreative power, into the hands of some people, which is then seen as aspirational, which then sharpens the pain if you can't have that as well. So yeah, we've got this rather sort of tricky feedback loop. But at the same time, I'll say with what you're saying just there, there's a couple of different things. You know, as people have fewer and fewer children, 
there is the opportunity to become more productive, that sort of counterbalance as well. If you're not caring for children, you're actually potentially more productive in a workplace kind of thing, which can balance out and actually lead to populations where the population is not accelerating as fast or even shrinking, becoming more productive. So it is quite interesting to see how that might affect, at least in the short term, things positively. I suppose the second thing as well is that new generations coming along identify their sexuality in a different way. And I think we may come back to this, but Generation Z, this sort of most recent population or generation coming along, has the lowest rate of identifying as purely straight. 71% of them in the Stonewall review in the UK Rainbow Report back in 2022. And within that, there's increasing levels of bisexuality and so on. And Does that make it more difficult to engage in long-term relationship with that diversity? But maybe, maybe we'll talk about that, you know, a, a yeah, little bit later. It's difficult to know. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it does change. It does change. It does change the outcome of intimacy and sexual relationships that are less likely to lead to yeah. the production of children. Let's say. So I think the balance is going to be interesting to strike. Yeah. So really fascinating yeah. stuff. So two levels. Uh, one is intimate relationship, as Christoph said, that are really very good for our health. And if we are healthy, you know, we kind of procreate healthier. While I was talking, I saw Christoph going back and forth, writing things down, sometimes nodding yes, sometimes very vigorously nodding no. So I'm very curious about your point of view, Christoph. Well, I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around what you just said. I think, I don't think it is incorrect but I think it's incomplete. So I, I definitely agree that there's more smart and, and educated women, as you say, and it might be difficult maybe, or they might be so Im impressive or amazing that many men would be afraid of women or that women wouldn't be less interested in men that are less educated. Might be true, but I think it doesn't show the, the entire picture. I think um, I think as, as, as Keith was already alluding to as well, I think there is a, a counter activity going on as well it's like the other side we live in a polarized world and i think we we see that polarization also in the that's in this aspect i think we you see that there's different type of of couples there's different types of relationships but there's also i think how would i put it i think we don't pay as much attention anymore to wealth at least the younger generation if you look at until 40 years old 42 43 they don't pay as much attention to wealth and education anymore as i mean the previous generations did so i do think that in that regard education level is not the most important thing for sure but of course, there is less sex. That is, I mean, we ha we're having less uh, sex. I, I found some numbers as well, which which were so astonishing. I think in the Netherlands, the average age of the first time having intercourse uh, went from 17-year-old uh, in 2012 to 18 and a half in 2017. So five and five years later, one year and one year and a half more. And I think even the physical contact, like kissing, is is, is being postponed. And I think. To me, one of the major reasons is not specifically the education, et cetera. It's, it has more to do with how we date, how we consume porn, even in, in, in many ways, which, which I think is, is, is paralyzing our, ourselves. I mean, if you look at yeah. all the different elements that, that could have an influence on how we have sex, it goes from the dating apps, the smartphones, the way that we go about our smartphones, the news cycles, the digital porn, the toys are out there, the way that we are doing parenting, you know, anxiety rates, what have you, antidepressants use, see sleep deprivation, there's this ob obesity, there's so many things that could play a role that to me are probably at least or even more important than a, the, the level of education. Well, let me help you there. Where do you meet your potential life partner? You used to meet it or at work, right? Remote, I think a big chunk has been, you know, or in social activities, which has also incredibly decreased, right? Or during school, where you, you have a school love, right? Or university, which a part has also been reduced to remote. So the conditions to meet someone that could be a potential lifelong partner and the, the opportunity to get a sense of who that person is and the vibe has disappeared for a big part. This is kind of the three major places where you kind of meet your life partner, right? Work, school, or vacation, right? 
So these also have been handicapped for a big, for a big part. Secondly, children stay at home way longer because financially it's very hard, as, as, as Keith said, you know, to have, to have a house, to rent something and things like that. And that doesn't help social interaction. So I think, yes, thank you very much. It is true, but it is incomplete because it's very complex, but there are things that scale incredibly right? And the things that scale incredibly are education and the places where we interact, right? So the party life has also been reduced. My daughter is 26 with the price of going out. Today, they just stay at home and they get hammered at home before they go out for one or two hours because financially you can't go out for two or three days because financially it's not possible. But anyway, thank you very much, Christophe. I think it's, it's really interesting. And I see uh, Aline nodding. So I'm sure she has some interesting things to say too. Exactly. No, that was a very, very interesting statement, very interesting argument. What I was thinking when you <clears throat> when you were talking is that I don't remember the number, but the the exact number, the number of, of single people in the world has never been higher. So yeah, it's difficult to to find someone. And also when you're mentioning that women are looking for for men to provide like related to education. I think society is changing and women are more and more empowered. They are providing for, for themselves and they are looking less for men to, to provide. Like in nine many cases, they are the one providing and we see more and more men being at home. So this is also changing a bit. And I think also linked to that change in society, people also working long hours, men and women are working more long hours and then you get at home and maybe you don't have time you don't have energy to have sex anymore so maybe that's also changing compared to maybe 40 50 years ago and another thing i was thinking about like the way you close your your, your statement the french president macron last week made a an, an, an announcement and he is actually asking french people to to have more sex, basically, because fertility is decreasing in France, and they they really want to encourage yeah more people to have to have more more kids. So there was interesting discussions around that. But in their view, so they say that infertility is a, is a taboo topic in France, and the government actually see it as their responsibility to to accompany and and support uh, people. That it's a public health issue in France, and they really want to encourage people to have more sex. So really, people turn that into a kind of a joke, saying exactly what you're saying, like let's let's have more sex. So it's interesting also to see the role of governments in in those topics. What a dire situation that we have to, to ask the French to have more sex. Keith, a last a last thing for you. Yeah, it's fascinating. Just a couple of quick points. The first of which is that I think it's I think it's sad that this sort of rise of the toxic masculine approach to how men interact with women and so on rises at the same time as we see a much greater balancing of the power and um, possibilities of women as well. Were and this is a rather broad statement, but were the male population more welcoming of these sort of very welcome changes as women taking greater roles and responsibilities and become more comfortable with that, then we could very readily adapt to the changing situation and address things. Mm -hmm. But instead, there seems to be this wedge coming in the middle, which is driving us further apart. And I think that's, that's a shame. I suppose the other thing when I was hearing about what you were saying about Macron, and I'm sure it's the same around the world as well. And in my lifetime, I've seen the opposite of this, you know, policies to reduce fertility rates in terms of benefits and so on in different countries. There's a real geopolitical element to all of this as well. We talk about depopulation and falling fertility rates. It's not the case in many other parts of the world, Indonesia, Africa, Bangladesh, and so on. These are rising powers. These are rising powers in terms of populations where fertility is definitely not an issue in terms of that. And I think underneath all of this is a geopolitical concern from some countries that the balance of power is shifting. Okay. And the, the sort of human capital uh, and resources are moving away. So I think that might be part of it too, for a different conversation. Okay, last but point. I think it plays into it. I'm doing a little Christophe Choquet because I'm very bad at moderating and we need to take care of the, the time. And Aline has something that kind of, you know, links to that because sexuality is one thing, but diversity in sexuality is another thing, Aline. And I think that's what your statement is about. You know, it's not one size fits all. 
Exactly. Yeah. So my statement is not as sexy as yours, Mo, but my point is that new technologies are empowering people with their sexuality. So there's different point to that. So we know that sex is often taboo, like especially when we talk about sex related issues like passionism for women or erective dysfunction for men. It's not always to talk about those topics or to find the right person to talk to and people remain with their issues without addressing them. And now the good news is that you have like certified apps that can help people address those issues from the comfort of their home at their own pace whenever they want. And then there's even a therapist or healthcare professionals available on demand if needed. And all of that in a safe space, respecting the privacy of those people without judgment of the fear of, of being judged. And I think that can really be like a game changer and having big consequences on sexuality and relationships. And another point would be the, the fact that we see an increase in sexual wellness apps like Mjoy or Rosie that will give you answers to doubts that you may have and you don't want to ask or you don't dare to ask. And they also offer like educational information about your body or your sexuality to help you discover or even try new things and enhance or spice up your, your relationships or s sexual wellness. And I think it really empowers people across all ages to live fully their, their life, their, their sexuality and be, be happier. Maybe that's something we didn't have like 40, 50 years ago, not that information that maybe you were feeling strange. You thought that something was weird or not normal about you, but actually all the women, all the men are experiencing the same. And I think that's where those apps are actually helping to realize that, well, what you thought was not normal is actually normal. There's nothing wrong with you. And the last point, more as you were saying, I think technology is also helping with inclusivity. So especially with, for people with disabilities of some sort, and it can offer them access to sex and pleasure. So that's why sex toys are seen as assistive technologies, just like earring heads or wheelchairs, and why a company like Ludi was born, keeping the sexual needs of disabled people in mind. So yeah, that's what I think that the, the technologies really are a game changer to really empower people and make their, their sexuality at the fullest. Mo, I see you nodding. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right. We see it in the clinic. Eh? We do a lot of regenerative therapies that affect sexual health. We call it the O shot, the G shot and the P shot. And it just changes people's lives. The only problem is it all, you know, to operate or to function normally, it's mostly all an extra cost. You know, the technology, you have to buy the app or you have to do the intervention. And I think what might be a little bit alarming and I'm, I'm talking about against the clinic because it's not reimbursed is that there's an opportunity for it to be part of the basic health service, right? So it's exceptional right now and it's valuable, but I don't think it's recognized for the value it has, as Christophe said, in our overall wellness and health. And that might be inclusive because it exists, but exclusive because there's a cost related, right? And that might be especially for sexual problems that are not mainstream, right? We see a lot of people also with general practitioners, you know, not being able to master it. And uh, they they get overall thing. I think erectile dysfunction has, has been helped a lot, you know, by just a, a simple pill. Hey, we all know it, but I think it all comes at a cost. And I think it I would love to see an evolution where sexual health is one of the basic rights and also reimbursed for people to enjoy some, something that is so crucial to their overall health. So that's my take to it. I love it. I think it's really good. And I think we need to move another step to make it more inclusive and less costly for people to enjoy that benefit. But yeah. Also, I think you're right on that point that those technologies are available, but the, the, the public and the healthcare professionals are not always always aware of them. So it doesn't actually reach the people that it, it should reach. Keith, what's your thought as a healthcare professional? Yeah, I suppose there's something I can say to what you said. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see this profusion of services, products and communities for people to better understand their sexual identity and focus on not only their sexual health, which was previously 
like the sole concern of the clinician, you know, sexually transmitted infections and so on, to something that allows a person to feel more holistically well. It's really, really wonderful. My concern is that in the marketplace of interventions in healthcare, how is sexual health and wellness going to compete against chronic disease, preventative medicine, acute care, and so on in healthcare systems that are increasingly pressured as well? I think that's a little bit of a concern on the back of this. And, and, and Mo, you were talking about, and Aline bringing this into an offering, it'd be great if this was a very open offering from the public health departments or sexual health and so on in there. But I just worry that those people making strategic decisions and funding things will say, well, what have we got here? We've got people that are having accidents or cancer care or, you know, an app that sells vibrators. That's a very sort of stark way of doing things. They go, which one am I going to go for? But that kind of thinking is going to make it difficult to get it included. I'm not saying this is a good thing. Of course, I'm saying the opposite. But we have to think very, very carefully about this. And I think part of it might be accepting and finding a way to reduce the cost of it being available directly to the consumer and supporting that and being comfortable with it, I think is probably going to get us further forward, at least right now, as we aspire for something more. Yeah, just one thing. The regular health system has therapies for the major diseases, which are cancer and cardiovascular, that are stripping people of their sexual health, statins create erectile dysfunction, cancer therapies create vaginal dryness, chemotherapy. So the main diseases that we're treating has collateral damage on the sexual part, which is not included in the, in, in the care. So, you know, I was just going to say, that's really interesting because I mean, you're absolutely right, but I'm just thinking about when I've prescribed for a patient and the side effects are listed on the medication. They may be buried quite deep in there. They're certainly not brought out in a categorical style. So erectile dysfunction and so on, it's an inconvenient thing to talk about, potentially when you're trying to get a person started on a medication. You might simply have a throwaway, go home and read about this. And then, of course, a person's at home, reads this, erectile dysfunction. I don't know about taking this. But then at that point, but am I going to make an appointment to go and speak to my doctor about erectile dysfunction? And you're right, it becomes, you know, a quiet thing. And they either don't take the medicine or they do take the medicine and suffer. Exactly. But actually, back, Christophe, to what you were saying at the, the beginning, you know, the, the positive impact of sexuality relationship on people, that will actually have, if we were supporting that in the healthcare systems, that will have a big impact on general health and also addressing those chronic issues that we were mentioning now. Yeah, but I mean, there's there's a lot that we that we could or could not do in the healthcare system. I think First and foremost, I think we need to consider sex care, if I may say so, to be the new self-care and, or at least be part of, uh, of, of, of self-care. And it doesn't always need to be part of the healthcare system. I think there's a lot around sexuality that we can already start ourselves and maybe even more quicker and more easier with better information that, that, a, that a physician might bring forward because it's always a little bit uncomfortable for a physician to talk about it. I, Actually, we talked about erectile dysfunction and certain pills in that matter. Well, I worked for three years on Viagra and I talked with a lot of physicians about erectile dysfunction. You can't imagine how difficult it is to, for them to talk about it, even with, with, with somebody who's there for an educational and informative role, let's say. So that is something I think we need to, and I think we are in, 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 in a good situation where we can empower people more. And you mentioned at a certain point, Aline, um, it doesn't always reach the people that need to that it needs to reach. Might be true, but I think we also need to look at it from a positive point of view. It it probably reaches more people than ever before. First of all, I think if if you look at you know we're all fans of CES, the the, the consumer electronic show in Las Vegas. Well, 2020 was the first time that sexual toys, let's say, sex toys were were part of the show. That before that, it was it was it was entirely forbidden. 2020, that's that's only three years ago. And it was actually part of the health and wellness section of, of, of the show. So I think that is already one, one big shift that we saw. But what you've seen in 2021 is even more remarkable, is that the, the whole sexual wellness and sexual toys market is, I think it's valued at about $20 billion, $20 billion, which is as big as the entire hairstyling products. 
So the money made from hairstyling products is as much as the money made from sex toys, which I think indicates quite a bit that there's a huge market potential and that, that it is reaching people. Because you, could, you should not forget that actually it is not possible to do advertisement for sex-related items on Facebook or Google. Mm -hmm. So they create the same amount of uh, value or the same size of market um, as hairstyling products without any advertisement. So, and I think it's really, I think we need to, you know, play on that vibe. It's a positive change. We need to amplify it and make sure that it reaches people because there are great initiatives you know, for disability people, but also people with cancer. I mean, when you mentioned it just a minute ago, the consequences of cancer could be um, nefast for, you know, for your sex life. Well, there are solutions out there like sex with cancer is, 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 is it's, it's that simple. You go to sex with cancer to come. Um, where people who had undergone sexual can cancer oncology treatment, cancer treatment, who share their experience and who even share certain devices or tools or lubricants or approaches or, or, or even mental support for the ones that actually go into the same thing right now. And so I really think, in my opinion, we should not look first to the healthcare system, but I think in this regard, we, there's a lot that we can do in the um, in the self merge segment where it is already growing and I think it will be growing a lot more and it will, as to, as to your statement, it will help people to empower or to have more power over their, um, their own sexuality for sure. No, I agree with you with the like more the consumer side, but if that information was reaching more the healthcare system and healthcare professionals could actually let the patients know about such solution that could really be a game changer for them. And that's what's missing today. Mm -hmm. So that was for my statement, but Keith, it would be interesting to hear your your statement now. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm nodding furiously there because yes, you know, why do we don't need to unnecessarily medicalize sex? You know, why, why do doctors and nurses need to be involved at all? But but let's come back to what you just said there about not understanding, and so that's to maybe my statement. Having seen this, and uh, I thought, well, what would be a useful thing from a uh, general practitioner or a doctor's perspective. My statement is this, is that, you know, as we, as we understand more about sexual health and wellness and our understanding of it evolves, healthcare professionals are, are struggling to keep up. Uh, they're struggling to keep up with not only this rapidly changing understanding of sexuality, sexual health and sexual wellness, but it's being amplified by an accelerating culture. And I will say that this is over and above difficulties with dealing with the basics of this as well. We've already talked about some of the difficulties. Christoph, you were saying when you were working, speaking to physicians, that they found it difficult to talk about erectile dysfunction, you know, with their patients. And this is almost a kind of traditional sexual health and wellness issues thing. So we're starting from an interesting base and things are getting different. So if my statement is about the difficulties of how we keep up with this, I suppose what I'm interested in is how do we, how do we improve that? And particularly how does technology help us improve that? So Aline, you mentioned that there were some apps out there and I'm certainly aware of some apps. I'm not aware of all of the ones that either you mentioned, and there's certainly going to be many more out there. The way that I find out about services that help patients is essentially as they come to me with an issue and they're comfortable discussing it with me. I'll give you an example of one of my patients with stoma care. They've had an operation and had part of their bowel removed and they have a stoma. Of course, these are people that are often young, old, doesn't matter. They still have an expectation for a good and full healthy sex, sex life. But where do you get the lingerie? Where do you, how do you feel sexy when you have these scars and so on? And so one of my patients was, you know, comfortable enough to sort of talk to me about that. And I remember I had no idea what to say at that point, but I did a little bit of looking and found a company called Vanilla Blush, which is a Glaswegian company that does online orders, Glasgow representing Scotland here, that do lingerie for those people who've had stomas and post-surgical as well to make people rightly feel as so beautiful and sexual as they should do as well. Now, for me as a doctor, I can approach this step by step by step, but each of these things makes it a little bit difficult to be immediately responsive to the needs of the person in front of me. And so I think one of the technological solutions is making clinically validated or validated app stores available which have sections on sexual health and so on. So if a person comes to me, we can readily identify it if it does need prescription or direction or people can find it themselves. But equally, I'm learning along the way. I think, you know, as we generate technological solutions, 
I can't sometimes hope to hold them all in my head, but making it easy for me to access them to help my, my patients would be very, very useful. Equally, I love my large language models. It's certainly true, and I've done some experiments with this, that you can have the model, the large language model, assume the role of a sexual health and wellness expert with a particular focus on the gay or lesbian experience, have it criticize or offer suggestions in there to me, which I can then share back as well. This is all about recognizing what the limits of competence are and identifying those with lived experience or knowledge and passing them on that way. I think technology can help there too. But there's a lot in there. I think I would start with that side of things. And I'd be interested, uh, Aline, actually coming back to you, you posed the question about how do doctors and healthcare professionals know about this? Have you seen any other interesting technological solutions for that? Like you mean to, to educate patients? Yeah, or doctors even, you know? Yeah, no, but they, they, their solution, maybe what I was also mentioning, some apps that can really uh, yeah a- educate and guide patients on certain conditions or, or diseases, but I really feel that you come across those like randomly us because we are in that space, digital health, we go to conferences, we read a lot and we can come across those. But I feel like a general patient or, or general healthcare professionals wouldn't know about those. So there's really a gap. And even yeah. for you, you know, there's there's a company in the UK who is reinventing the speculum for the, the gynecologist. Yes, I saw that, yeah. And that's also, that should get to the gynecologist. You know, they should be aware of that. That's a game changer for both gynecologists, like kind of a, a, a connected speculum that will change the expense for the, the patient as well. So those information needs to, they need to flow and to arrive to the right person. And then, and then there we have, you know, where does technology come in as well? And I think the second part that I would emphasize here is the incredible role of social media and online platforms of not only allowing people to understand more about the diversity of experience in terms of sexual identity, sexual practices and sexual wellness and health. A good friend of mine, Mark Pereira, who's uh, Dr. Gay UK on TikTok, very, very active and interested in the LGBTQ community. And he makes it his mission to help break down stigma and taboos and ignorance about practice and does so not only for patient groups, but also <laughs> for clinicians as well. In fact, in preparation for thinking about this, I thought, who am I going to go to that knows the most about this? I'm going to phone Mark and had a good conversation with him to understand more. So the point I'm making about going to the right person, going to the right source of information, recognizing that it's difficult to keep it all in your head is really important. I think we need to be happy to do so and empower our patients. And in in, in this case, also under identifying those people, again, with lived experience of these different sexual, sexual preferences, orientations can be helpful because a patient is con- possibly going to feel more comfortable speaking to someone who understands on a more personal level some of the issues they're going through. In terms of the social media side, though, Christoph Mo, you know, what are your sort of takes on that, that the role of those platforms to help raise the level of understanding in healthcare systems? Well, I think it's a, it's a regular topic on the podcast, right? Where we talk about the, in, the impact of um, medfluencers, healthfluencers, even health entertainment. And I think coming back to the, the earlier point that I'm, that I made, is it all the responsibility of the healthcare system? Probably not. I think there's a lot that can be done within the, uh, within social media platforms or other platforms. Uh, so I, I definitely think that it is a, it is a valuable platform to educate people and to normalize things and to, to make things something that you can discuss with people. I thinking about technology in the future, you mentioned large language models right now. ChatGPT, for example, does not allow any sexual content, right? Nor romantic relationship related stuff. So even sexual educators would not be allowed. There are in the store that recently opened, there are a ton of them, unfortunately, or that is supposedly will be opened very soon is that is that there's already a ton of them. And they started removing them one by one, but there were so many that they actually stopped removing them. So it's very, very curious to see how large language model will play a role in in, in, in that regard for sure but but isn't isn't that interesting because 
an, an overly blunt approach to adult subjects, what we've just discussed a little bit earlier on is actually actively impacting the health and wellness of a population, and probably more worryingly, doing so in a way that is discriminatory, in the sense that some practices might be more particular to different groups, or people in different countries with different models having been trained and aligned in different ways, will make it very, very hard for people in those countries to access this. And we can think of several examples around the world where that might be the case. Yeah. I think maybe just to come back on your point on what's the role of the physician and what, what can technology do in there is that I saw one particular study that was published in The Lancet in February 2023 that was done by the National Institute for Health Research in the UK. And so what they, what, they, what they brought forward was actually what you're saying. On the one hand side, there's sexual health, which is related to diseases or the absence of diseases and, and coercion, perhaps, that is related to um, sexual health. But there's also sexual well-being which is, as we mentioned already several times during, during the podcast, is a very essential concept for public health, right? Because it impacts our overall well-being. But very often physicians don't really know what it means or what is, how do we identify bad sexual well-being. Um, it, there's, there's no recognition for the, the, the term sexual um, well-being even. And so I think this, this is something that we need to reflect upon I, because I, it was very well, it's a very long article, but it was very well written. They even identified it with, you know, respect, self-esteem, experience, sexual experience, et cetera. But again, it made me think, this is, is this something that a physician needs to bear? Is, he needs to be aware of it, but if it's, is, is it really the responsibility or should we push it back again to technology and platforms and so forth? As a first, yeah. at least as a first layer. Yeah. I come back to what I said at the start. We shouldn't unnecessarily medicalize sex. Why should it? Why should your doctor, why should she determine whether you can or can access, you know, the right information and so on? We've got to find the balance. And Mo, you're, you're nodding away there. I'll maybe give yeah. you maybe a last word here before I hand back. Yeah. So I think we're taking the, if it's not physician, it needs to be technology, but it can also be an intermediate. I think there's a opportunity for new professions to emerge, which, which can be health navigators or health coaches that can help you navigate the landscape, what is available out there. So I think if, you know, internet is the biggest shop in the world, I think people get also tired and demotivated of trying to find the right solution. So I think people, you know, might be willing to invest an hour to help them navigate. First of all, understand what the physician just said. What does that mean? Where can I get coverage? Is there any app that can help me and things like that? So I think there's a, there's a, a reinvention of an intermediate profession and business and marketplace where there is service to help you navigate your sexual health, wellness or health overall. Right. So. There is, or the personal trainer, or but there is, I think there's a gap and a vacuum in between for people who say, you know, my parent, my mother is old. She didn't understand what that means, these drugs and things like that. So I think there's a really big market opportunity and also a very valuable opportunity for an in intermediate profession, which just helps you digest and navigate what the physician just said. And I think if there is a slipstream of digital services after that conversation, that might be incredibly, incredibly valuable. We talked about what you just said, Mo, in the episode. I was just looking it up in episode number five on care tuning, where we had uh, Eugene Barakovich also present, which actually...